Okay, well, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you coming out to support Andrew here. Um, we're really glad to welcome him back on campus. Andrew is actually a 2010 graduate of Wharton undergrad, where he studied group effectiveness um, or organizational effectiveness, and he was one of our very own co-chairs of the Wharton Alumni Relations Council. So currently, Andrew is working as a Deloitte Human Capital Consultant in New York City, and he's working there to um, foster leadership effectiveness um, and talent strategy execution um, at Deloitte and currently he's working for the former global CEO of Deloitte um, to deliver a diagnostic tool to clients um, in order to foster just that leadership effectiveness and group effectiveness. So a uh, man after my own heart, imported from Detroit, he likes uh, Chrysler commercials um, as, well, as well as Red Wings hockey and Michigan football. So. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, and just so you all know, uh, Andrew has graciously offered to let us uh, record this so we can share with other Wharton undergrads. So just be aware that we are recording. And thank you so much yeah. for coming. So um, so thank you first for that introduction. Um, so let, let me just say two things right out of the gate. Maybe it's one. I don't know. So first thing, um, totally true. It is being recorded. I have a mic on. That doesn't mean that after this talk, I'm going to take the mic off, and you can ask whatever you want about your job search, about your upcoming internship, about it just doesn't matter. So don't feel like, you know, I want you to feel comfortable, especially given that you know, I'm only two years out. You know, I'm not like some distant alum who's you know, been far removed from the analyst experience and a job or you know, the Wharton experience. I want you to feel you know, like we can have a dialogue. It's, you know, the end game won't be, just the talk. Um, so cool. It's, thank you for the introduction. It's so true. I am importer from Detroit. Who saw that Clint Eastwood commercial? <laughs> Who, did anyone see it? Yeah, a couple saw it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Is it like a Democratic ad or Republican? No, neither. I think it's neither. I think it's just rock star. Okay. So speaking of rock star, this is me. Um, so I only present this this picture because according to Malcolm Gladwell, you have 30 seconds to make an impression. Okay, and I've probably already passed that 30 second mark. But I'm taking my best shot at that thesis that you got to make a dent in those first 30 seconds. And I hope you're impressed by this picture. This is me, I don't know, in my youth. You can probably see the hair a little bit. Um, I always like to note the fact that my gloves are as big as my head. Uh, you know, if you think about that, that's just interesting now as a grown person. So you're looking at this thing. What? Am I at a wedding? Am, am I? You know, are we getting married? Dude? Well, what's happening? I already told these guys that I already have three kids. Um, you know, a lot happens when you leave Wharton. You know, stuff moves really quick. Um, no, the the reason that I, I present this picture today um, is to say, when you're at a wedding, what if you've ever been to one? Um, I've only been a ring bearer in two of them. I haven't been to any family weddings. I was about this big. You know, probably even younger than the hockey picture. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah come in. How'd your interview go? Yeah, all right, good. All right, so, so, when you're at a wedding, one of the things that they start the wedding by saying is, dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to do something, whatever, I, I lost track after that part, okay? And so what we're here to do today, what I'm here doing today, why I came on a Friday and, you know, Deloitte thinks that I'm, you know, in Timbuktu and whatever, why I'm here today is to talk to you about, okay, you're at Wharton now, okay, you're a sophomore, you're a junior, you're a freshman, maybe, you know, somehow you sneaked in as a preferred applicant, you know, then you're already in here, and you're saying, I'm learning all this stuff in the core, and I'm in, I'm in finance, and I'm in accounting, and I'm in stat, and God, sometimes I want to bang my head against the wall, it's so hard, and, you know, maybe my team is really jacked up in, you know, in marketing, and I'm really unhappy with it, whatever, I want you to say, where do the lessons that you're learning in the Wharton core, how can you not only appreciate them in their current form, but also say, how are they going to translate later in your life? How will those lessons apply to your post-Wharton experience in the real world? So that's dearly beloved. We're gathered here today to do that. That's what we're talking about. So I'm going to go class by class. And, you know, I want, you know, to, you to, um, there'll be instances for some involvement. I'm not, you know, we're not going to do a magic trick. I'm going to cut your body in half. It's not going to happen. But I will solicit your input because you guys are actually closer to some of these courses than I am and likely learned a lot more in them than I did. Um, you know, you guys are, you know, come on. I mean, I, yeah, you're smart. All right, so let's start with 100. So you may recognize this woman. Does anyone recognize this woman? I, you know, you, you, you know, I have this picture blown up in my, you know, apartment in Manhattan, um, and when you walk in, you see Dr. G, uh, and, you know, she reminds me 
of a lot of things. One of the things that I remember from Management 100 is this idea of creative tension. Who remembers that idea? Did everyone take it with Dr. G? Yeah? Okay. What did Dr. G use when she talked about creative tension? Can you almost, a rubber band, right, exactly. Did she even, she may have gone like this a little bit, right? Okay, that was like the hand motion. What else do you remember from Management 100? Are there any other things that you remember maybe? You did maybe a status report, right? Anyone have a good status report experience? I got the lowest grade on this, I'm not even kidding you. The lowest grade given out the entire year for a status report was a 12 out of 20. I got that 12 out of 20. My partner, Steve Ariel, you know, and I, we literally had a Bowflex advertisement as part of our um, Measure 100 presentation. We had a, a hand clap routine. I'm not even kidding. Um, <laughs> and, you know, for those of you who know a little bit more about me, I, I was a Measure 100 TA too, so it's kind of ironic that I then coached the kids and I had the lowest grade. So you learned how to maybe deliver a presentation in 100, okay? One of the other things that, you know, you may have learned in Major 100 was about what makes teams effective, okay? You learned about, okay, you're part of a new group and everybody's bringing different skills, you're just getting settled at Penn. Can anyone tell me who's pictured here? Who would you say? Penn State, the Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno, okay? Great coach, okay? Fantastic coach. And I would look at this and if you're Dr. G, you could say, can I look at Joe Paterno as um, a manager of a team, okay? Or a member of a team, in the same way that each one of these players is a member of that team. And one of the things that I have taken away in my you know, brief time outside of Warden is that when you are a leader of a team, your first job is to really uh, devote your energy to enabling that team's success. And I use that verb purposefully. You're, you can think of enablement in two ways, okay? You can think of it as nourishing their souls, and you can think about helping them to accomplish their tasks. So one of the cool stories about Joe Paterno, I'll just give you an example of how he nourished souls. I don't know if any of you ever read this article. It was on ESPN or somewhere. Joe Paterno convinced a recruit to come to Penn State instead of Michigan or another great you know, Big Ten program because he called him on his birthday. Okay, so this is a, a recruit. Joe was incredibly busy. He probably was giving an interview to ESPN five minutes prior. And he calls the recruit to say, hey, I saw you know you you know are thinking about coming to Penn State. Happy birthday. Okay? The kid still has the voicemail. And when you think about what a manager can do to enable his or her team's success, think about Jopa. Think about doing something that gets here. That, that impacts the heart in such a dramatic fashion that uh, fuels that kid's desire to give everything on the field for Jopa because Jopa cared that much to take time to call this guy. You may have heard Obama just called Betty White and left her a happy birthday message. Same idea. People that want to enable the success of others, support others, that want to be part of something great, care about people at that level. All right, that's the laser. All right, so the third part to each one of these segments, we're going to wrap up with a quote. Just because I've done a lot of reading, and I think there, there's some great things to take away. The piece that I just shared about the two ways you can drive change, enabling, oh, hey, why don't you, come on in, come on in. God, all right. Ron T, all right. So... Let's just read this quote together. If management is to have an enduring meaning in the world, it should improve people's lives. Management should enrich the lives of people working inside the organization, enabling them to succeed at the work that has real value to their customers, the community, and themselves. Okay, think about that. That's, that's what the new management is. That, that's how Management 100 applies to the real world. And if your manager is doing this, you need to stay at your current job. Okay. Who took B Pub 250? Anybody? Yeah, okay, so I told you about um, uh, my 12 out of 20 on the status report, right? I, yeah, yeah. I've admit, I told you, I can't really remember. So in B Pub 250, okay, I had to take B Pub 250 two times. <laughs> two times, okay? One time would be plenty for the average human, okay? But two times, that's what Andrew Stern did, okay? I just couldn't get enough of it. So, but the greatest part about BPUB 250 two times is that the second time, I didn't take it you know, with just the already elite group of Wharton students that we call our cohort or whatever the word is now. I took it with the kids that transferred into Wharton. 
i.e. had a 385 or above pre-Wharton and are super smart. So those were the kids I took BPUB 250 with the second go around. And I remember the professor, you know, sitting me down after the midterm saying, Andrew, you really don't get it. <laughs> that, that was just a great memory of mine. Okay. So who's this? Anyone take This isn't Beepo. I don't love it. It's just still here. All right, good. So Rebecca was Econ 10. Um, what did you learn in Econ? What were some of the things you learned? You should shout them out. Supply and demand. Supply and demand. Good, good. Right, like taxes maybe or like shortages or surplus, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah probably some of that. It's all a blur, honestly, for me. Okay, so Rebecca talks about that. I want to talk about a different kind of Econ, Okay. I want to talk about the econ, the economics of you, okay? So we're not talking about a market, we're not talking about a product, we're not talking about taxes, we're talking about you, okay? As you guys start to think about the careers that you want to get into, as you start to think about the companies that you want to support, as you start to think about the industries that you want to dump yourself into, okay, and be a part of, you want to strive to be what's called a linchpin, okay? Anyone familiar with that word? A little bit, yeah? Okay, cool. So this picture is taken from Seth Godin's book called Lynchpin, okay? And it, it's one of kind of my Bibles in the sense that it's something that all of us should aspire to be at any level within the company, whether you're an intern, whether you are a full-time employee, whatever it may be, you want to be the go-to person. You want to be the person that you know, enables other people's success, as we talked about with Jopa, and is indispensable. And the ways that you can be indispensable are by delivering at levels beyond your current level. Okay, so just to give you an example, right? I have struggled with the idea that an analyst in a human capital consulting firm, a terrific one in Deloitte, is not necessarily in a sales role. Okay? I, I believe that any person on any team at Deloitte should have the ability to sell a project. Okay? That you should um, you know, seize a need, see a need and pursue it. And, you know, I have had conversations with this guy who I now work for, the former CEO of Deloitte, um, and pitched potential sale opportunities to him. And he has called CEOs of other companies on my behalf to solicit business for Deloitte. And so I can't call a CEO. None of us could. But Jim, the CEO of Deloitte, can. And so you just want to think about how can I help other people? How can I enable other people's success? Jim is really excited about having a new client. But do something that isn't necessarily expected at your level. So this is the econ of you. It's the idea that you are irreplaceable. Your price, your supply, your demand, there's only one of you. And you need to make sure everybody knows about you. And that there's incessant demand for you by the things or through the things that you do. So that's this idea of linchpin. Okay, so here we go. This is you know the, the book shout out in the bottom, right? The competitive advantage the marketplace demands is someone more human, connected, and mature. Someone with passion and energy, capable of seeing things as they are and negotiating multiple priorities as she makes useful decisions without angst. Flexible in the face of change and resilient in the face of confusion. That's a linchpin. You know, and this is like another quote that I have right next to Dr. G in my apartment in Manhattan. Okay, Opum. God, this is another one that I really tripped up on. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, okay, so what did you learn at Opum? What were some of the things you learned? Annie? God, it sounds like it was a really impactful class. <laughs> okay, I remember in Opum, um, our final project, we had to program Excel in ways you know that I knew then and can't remember now to go to weather.com, pull information about Philadelphia weather, and then deploy a painting team based on the information it pulled from weather.com. I prefer to just check weather.com and make a decision, <laughs> um, but that's what Opum taught me. <laughs> this is Chandra Hill teaching Opum. So you learned all the stuff about VBA, right? And maybe H lookup and V lookup. I don't know what they stand for. I, I mean, it's just like foreign to me still. But you learned stuff about how to play in Excel. Okay, you learned about data. You learned about how you can transfer data, like a lot of it, into information. And I, I'll make that distinction purposely. Data into information. Who's this? Anyone know? <laughs> Steve Ball. Correct. Okay. And, you know, I took this picture of Steve because it was the closest one I could find of a CEO who had his hand on his heart. Okay. And 
It's sort of like that. Maybe he looks like he's having a heart attack, sort of. Okay? <laughs> I hope not. He's probably some, you know, Davos or something. So this picture is meant to communicate. Steve's hand on his heart is supposed to say the new love affair for CEOs, their new heartthrob, is data. That's what I have learned in my first two years with Deloitte. Okay? And not just data, but information. Okay? So this project that I'm on right now that we spoke about at the start of this, this talk, we are educating CEOs about the extent to which their people are not simply supportive of their company strategy, but committed to it. So not support, but committed. And when I say committed, I mean like willing to give their nights and weekends to it. Like willing not to die for it, but to really give of themselves in every sense of the word to this strategy. And the way that we're doing that is through a survey, but converting that survey into an iPad app that a CEO can easily flip through and learn and leave with the conclusion of, show me. Just show me. Don't just tell me that my people are actually committed to something. Don't tell me that they're supportive. Don't tell me you know, that, that the groups operate in this way. Show me. And so you, when you think about, God, open was so hard, or you know, whatever, you're in a, a class that requires a lot of Excel, say to yourself, at the end of the day, these CEOs that potentially you're preparing deliverables for as a full-time, as an intern, they want to see the data. They're thirsty for it. They're thirsty for the quantitative rigor that you brought to your analysis. All right, marketing. Anybody took marketing? Yeah. What'd you learn? Saber. Saber. Great example. Oh man, I took marketing in the summer. And we didn't have to do Saber. <laughs> May have been the best decision I made. Um, what else? What else, guys? Marketing mediums, maybe like different channels that you could uh, deploy a marketing strategy through. Maybe you learned about how you would go after a particular audience. You know, like maybe. Maybe you learned about consumer behavior. In fact, this guy, Jonah Berger, um, taught a consumer behavior course that I took my first semester senior year. A terrific professor. If you guys ever have the, the chance to be with Jonah Berger for a class, take it. Um, he didn't teach marketing one-on-one -on -one at the time, but maybe he will. One of the things that we talked about in Jonah Berger's class, consumer behavior, was this idea of mass marketing. Okay, So getting your word out in mass. So think about like Coca-Cola, okay, or Pepsi, like a huge, terrific brand that um, is looking to touch every corner of the United States, right, with their product, okay, and, and penetrate every market. So you can almost think of like a parabola, okay, in your mind, that mass market in the middle, not the people who hate Coke or, you know, the other people on the side, that mass, that's what they're going for, that mass market. Instead, <coughs> what I'm observing in the real world now is that mass market is an idea is dying, okay? And instead, that middle thing, that 90% right in the middle, instead, that 90% is a mass, but it's a mass of individual tribes. It's a mass of individual niches that come together into one mass, but it's the idea that the mass is not just one thing anymore, okay? <laughs> so this picture that I present to you um, is also taken from Seth Godin. Seth, um, does a case study about a hotel, this particular motel actually, um, in the bad neighborhoods of Southern, or, uh, San Francisco. Anybody from San Fran? No? Okay, me neither. So, <laughs> so this particular ho or motel, okay, you can see clearly, right? Let's work this. Boom, laser pointer. Clearly, like motel, right? Like <laughs> this is not the Ritz, this is not the Venetian, this is not, you know, the Rittenhouse Hotel in downtown Philadelphia. This is a motel, okay? But, this swimming pool is hand painted. Okay, this is not you know your Holiday Inn. Every man for you know it's the same standard swimming pool. It is not. This thing with a brush was painted, and what the 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 tiles were not you know painted beforehand. Some guy or a whole team of guys and gals was in this pool putting those little checkers around and those numbers on the. That was a whole group of people. Okay, and believe it or not, this motel, a motel, I'm saying charges several hundred dollars a night for people to stay in those rooms with this pool in San Francisco's bad neighborhood. Okay, Why do I use this as an example? Somebody in that mass cares about it. And they're a part of one of those tranches, one of those niches that now comprise the mass. Okay, So as you're thinking about, God, you know, I want to go into brand, I want to go into marketing, I want to go... It's no longer about the mass. In fact, let's just look at Seth's words himself. Okay? 
Mass is about the center, the big, fat, juicy, addressable center. Governments, marketers, teachers have organized around serving and profiting from mass. The center is melting. Okay? New way to think about this idea that you probably were introduced to in marketing 101 or consumer behavior. Okay. Gosh. Statistics. I need to take a sip. <laughs> My goodness. Okay. So, statistics. Um, I took statistics during the summer as well. Also a good decision for Andrew Stern. Um, and you're saying stuff, why is there a rock band? This is so weird. This is like bizarre. There are all these dudes and they've got, you know, funky scarves and he's got shades on and it's inside. He must be cool. So I put this up because I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Kabir, who was in this band evidently. I took this from his Facebook. If he's, you know, watching this movie, shout out to Kabir. Um, Kabir got me through Statistics 101. Some of the things that we worked on together were things like what? Uh, it was like the F test, the T test, that, right? The T test, yeah, yeah. Why is it called the T test? And Certain degrees of freedom or something. I don't know. You're good. I, I yeah. I even misspelled. I even misspelled the T test. Okay, like I put T E E. I'm like, why would you just have one letter? It's weird. So, so um, we're talking about stat, right? We learned about the T test. Did you have? Um, was there a program? Did you use like Stata or something like that? Jump. 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 Right. Clearly, I was in a different planet, like <laughs> using Stata. Uh, you learned about like statistically significant versus maybe economically st significant. So, like, oh yeah, it's like statistically, does it actually matter? Like, does it actually matter if this percent, you know, it's just like, it's a number, good to know. It's just different concepts, right? So you learned a little bit about numbers. And you, the idea in statistics, right, is to predict maybe with some kind of rigor, this is going to happen, right? Or I can predict with this percent of confidence, this percent of certainty, some event will happen, this number will be this, whatever. Now I'm going to show you a different picture. Okay, this guy is Andy Stefanovich, one of my mentors. And Andy Stefanovich looks at statistics a totally different way. And he asks the question, what if you're wrong? Okay, so statistics is all about predicting so that you will be right every time. And Andy says, what if you're wrong? What if you predicted, you know, with 98% certainty or whatever, but that 2% ends up coming true? What happens? What happens? What happens if you fail? What happens if you tripped up? What happens if you made a mistake? And, you know, what, what I, I, I want to instill in you today in this particular section, the stat section, is to say, I want you all to think about when you're looking for a job, when you're looking for your career, when you're thinking about your plays as you, be, as you launch post-warden, and even when you're here, look for a job that allows you to take intellectual risks, okay? Look for a job in which you can take those risks and fail, and for it to be accepted that you will fail. Because without question, I, I guarantee, you will learn more from your failures than you will from, the, the, from, from any team member nodding their head and saying, perfect job. you spot on. You will not learn as much. In that failure moment, you will have learned more than perhaps the 10 previous successes combined. Okay? Andy pushes people and companies to get comfortable with failure. So, a couple quotes from Andy. Okay? I often ask clients, What's the definition of insanity? Without fail, one person in every group will offer up doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Exactly. What are you waiting for? Take a moment to look around you. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose if you're wrong? What happens? Okay, here's another one. Get disciplined in creating bad ideas. Right? We always think about, like, my idea, when I'm coming out, like, they're judging me, it has to be perfect. What if it's a really crappy idea? What happens? Okay? You become a winner because you're good at losing. You ever thought about that? You're a winner because you're good at losing. It's not because you just lose. It's because you're good at losing. Okay, you learn from every loss. Much more, especially, than if you won. Okay, this one's great. Fail and fail again and then fail better. Okay? Every time you're going to get better. Okay? And every, with every failure, with every time you stretch the envelope a little bit and you push the boundary a little bit and maybe you fell, you're going to get back up. Oh boy. Okay, counting 101 and 102. God, are you noticing a theme? The quantitative courses weren't necessarily my forte at one. <laughs> Dr. G and me, though, homies. <laughs> so, counting 101 and 102. So, anybody have I don't know if he teaches you guys. Um, does this picture look familiar to anybody? Can you make out who this guy is? He does teach accounting at Penn. 
Maybe only at the NBA level now. Okay. So I told I sold this from his Facebook because the boy friended me after the class. I think I probably just begged so much that he would let me stay in the class as opposed to have to repeat it again <laughs> that we became good friends. So his name is Gavin Kasser, a terrific professor of accounting with a great personality. And um, Gavin, you know, taught our course. Um, you know, I think I had him for Accounting 102. Um, we, we come back to the core right at the start, right? You learn about the credits and debits, right? That's what I always took away is like this idea. I, I really couldn't wrap it around my brain. You know, some accounts going up and some's going down and there's like this relationship, right? Like one gets a credit, one gets a debit. And there's like some accounts that are effective, but not all of them. And which one, can you envision like the balance sheet? You got to fill in the bubbles, right? God, okay. <laughs> need, a, need a Xanax just talking about it. <laughs> Okay, so Gavin taught all those kinds of, of concepts, right? And you know, they all make my heart race because I struggled through them. And I want to stretch your mind a little bit now, okay, and bring up this guy Keith Ferrazzi. Anybody ever heard of Keith Ferrazzi? Name ring a bell? Okay. So Keith Ferrazzi is the former chief marketing officer of Deloitte. And he now, and I think after that, he went and became the chief marketing officer for Starwood Hotels. Anybody ever say like a W? Okay. Your experience at the W is from Keith's brain, okay? The little floor mat in the morning where it says, good morning, W, the, you know, whatever, the little check-in card, whatever it is that's cool and different and hip, that's Keith's brain, okay? And so Keith now has a company focused on helping people to build relationships, okay? And how they can most effectively, both personally and professionally, not network, but develop good relationships, okay? And you may say to yourself, like, how, why is Andrew bringing up relationships with accounting? Okay, like maybe that's just where his mind was during accounting. The truth is, though, a lot of people think about their development of both personal and professional relationships as a giant income statement, a giant credit and debit system. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You better scratch it right away because, like, I'm helping you, so you better help me right away. Instead, I want you to think about an idea where you don't approach professional or personal relationship building and not networking, right? In that way where you're helping somebody and then they have to help you instantaneously or soon thereafter. Instead, I want you to, when you're going to these networking events for your companies, when you're you know, meeting new people at info sessions, when you're in your internship, you're meeting someone for the first time, the first thing that you should think about when you're learning about people is what can I do to help this person, okay? What can I do to enable this person to be successful? What does this person care about? So I have a, a current training in a Deloitte deck that I've built. Um, and there's a slide that literally has a, a picture of a present on it. Okay? And the idea is that everything a client says to you is a present. Every bit of information, you should look at it in that way. The stuff where they're talking about their kids, that is just as valuable as the stuff when they're talking about their inability to deliver on time to their client or their customer, rather. Okay? Every bit of it is the same value. Because if that, for example, that executive has a child who has a particular learning disability, let's say, okay, and you are able to link him up with a particular learning disability specialist, okay, that would be more helpful than anything you would ever do for his or her company. Okay? In the same vein, if the CEO says to you, or you know, at our level, it's probably you know, a manager or something like that, you know, I need help with XYZ deliverable, you not only want to make that deliverable impeccable, you want that thing to be so strong, Arnold Schwarzenegger you know, could tear it apart, okay? Because he's so strong. You want, it, you want it to say, I went above and beyond. I actually thought, so you asked for X, and I gave you X plus more. And the X plus more, that more factor, you may not like it all the time. In fact, that could be counted as a failure. But when I gave you that more, you're going to give me feedback on that more. And when I get the feedback on the more piece, I'm going to know what you want. I'm going to know what you would value. I'm going to know how to add more value than just the X piece. And if you can do it in companies, if you can add that kind of a presence and be, as we started with, that linchpin, remember the fist with the lightning bolt through it? If you get to that level, you've won. All right, so Keith, don't keep score. That's his quote, okay? The idea of credits and debits does not apply to relationship building. You should always be thinking, I guess, I don't know if this will be debit or credit, depends how you look at it. You want outflows all the time. Okay? You just want to be given all the time. And then the moment that you need, you need to lean on somebody, they're there. Okay? But you never go into offering for help without or with the expectation that they're going to instantaneously help you back. Legal site. Okay. This one I like.
Um, this one was a good class. Um, I had uh, Tara Radin for this course, and I'm still in touch with you. You guys should, seriously, when you graduate, you should keep in touch with your professors, because you will be surprised by the amount of postgraduate knowledge and networks they're willing to open up for you. So this is not Tara Radin, obviously. This is a gentleman by the name of Nick Constan. Love the tie. He's a big rower. So that's another thing, right? So like, that was a present. Nick told me he liked rowing, okay? Nick's the kind of professor, he like took an, a classmate of mine uh, and me out to dinner on the main line. Okay? He's like that kind of a guy, like a really cool, neat guy. Nick actually had for legal studies, um, yeah, it was 101. Tara I had for 210. I mixed them up. So one of the things you learn in legal studies, right, it's like contracts, right? And business ethics probably bleeds a little bit into like 210. Um, you learn about the different parties. I'll never forget Nick Constan. If you can envision legal studies one-on-one type setting, everybody's sitting around in those U-shaped rooms maybe. Nick said, okay, we were supposed to read the Smith versus Johnson case for today. You know, Mr. Stern, would you please rise and brief the class on what you learned from this case? So I get, walk up, and this is in front of the whole room, and you're like, oh my God, like I'm sweating, and you know, the whole bit. And you're knowing Nick Constan, you know, this big, strong guy, and he's you know, no, looking at you, just shaking his head the entire time, <laughs> saying, I, I, I don't know what planet you dropped from, kid, but he literally said, Mr. Stern, thank you for you know, giving your best effort. Would you please sit down? <laughs> Mr. Stern, thank you for entirely missing the point of this case. Um, would anyone like to help Mr. Stern? Would anyone like to give this another go? The entire class is like, <laughs> <laughs> okay? So that's what I learned in Legal Studies 101, right? So it's like this idea of rules, right? You know, in business, you know, in, in the contracts that you're developing, in your negotiations uh, with a, another client, whatever it may be, another company, you can do this, you can't do that, you can do this. It's like, it just spells it out for you, right? And um, it's, it's limiting to that extent, right? That's what you learn in business ethic, or in uh, legal studies, right? This idea, you gotta draft it, it's gotta be written out. I want you to throw out the you can't piece, okay? And I want you to apply this idea to your life, okay? If you walk in uh, to, any, to any company, okay? And you go in with the mindset of you can this, you can't that, you can this, you can't that, you have lost the opportunity to create value. Okay, so just let that sink in for half a second, okay? If you walk in and you say, you know, my job is, you know, just at, at, at the analyst level, I'm just supposed to do, you know, great work, and you know, I'm just supposed to, you know, build the deck and, you know, send it to my manager and let my manager review it, the manager will ship it to the partner, and, you know, that, that's the order of operations, you've lost. You haven't won at all. If you operate from this mindset of forget the can't, because I'm going to do the can, okay? I'm going, you know, the analyst isn't supposed to sell a project, okay? The analyst is not supposed to um, contact a, a CEO of a company or do a demo for a client on his own. But just because isn't supposed to doesn't mean you can't, okay? It means you can, and you should simply, if you get knocked down, just get back up again, okay? The quote that, you know, um, um, Frequently I, I hear is you, you fall seven, you get up eight. It's that idea of try, 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 and try again, okay? So here's a, a little quote. It's time to stop complying with the system and draw your own map. Throw out the manual. The world needs you to bring your genius to work, okay? It's the idea that, you know, I want you to almost think of yourselves as a cartographer, okay? It's a, it's a, a not-so-common word, right? Like think like Columbus, right? You're drawing the map. Okay, you know, he was, his map was probably a different shape than what we got today. But it's the idea that there may be a path, you don't have to follow it, okay? You don't have to go um, into an industry where all of your friends are going into. You don't have to work for a firm that recruits on campus. You don't have to do the job, um, just the job, rather. You do have to do the job. You have to do more than the job, though. So you have to stretch what the job asks of you, okay? So that's the idea, like, being your own map maker. Take control of your destiny. Own it. You know, it's like at Deloitte they always say, and I, I think it's a, a terrific phrase for our organization, own your career, okay? And you're already doing it now. You're choosing your concentrations, right? You're saying, you know, Andrew, I mean, I didn't study finance beyond finance 100 and 101. I did not take a single finance class after that, you know? That's not my sandbox. My sandbox was the management stuff. I could play in that sandbox all day. In hockey equipment or without it, you know, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And so you just got to know what, what makes you tick. What do you want to do? And just go get it. Okay, Management 101. Um, I took this class during the summer as well, so my experience is probably a little bit different than yours. Um, 
I had a professor, Linda Cohen, who's no longer with uh, Wharton. Um, and we learned a couple of things. But I'd be curious, have any of you taken Manager 101? What'd you take away? Anything? God. You know, I, I, so it's funny, I, I, I had a... I had a meeting uh, this morning with G95, some folks upstairs, and, you know, they're, like, wanting some feedback, you know, on how the core was, you know, impacting my postgraduate life and, you know, whatnot. I'm saying I'm giving this talk today. Evidently, they need to do a lot more in the core from you guys. My God, not making the same debt. So here's what I took away from Management 101, right? One of the things, don't worry. Like, I know you're probably, like, already, like, reading all the bullet points. You know, that was a great action verb. Maybe I should use that on my resume. Don't go there, okay? This is literally jacked off of the... Um, the Penn Career Services website, okay? It's just pulled straight from, it's like the one that they have as a sample. And this girl is really, I think, yeah, Candace, really impressive. Like, really, like, Jesus, look at that GPA for crap. 357, a low dolly. 392 in high school, 3% of her class. I, I mean, look at that, 250 million pre-IPO. I mean, I, I didn't take past finance 100, so I don't know what that means, but you know what I mean? She's impressive, okay? Okay, let me rock your world for half a second. When you get into the working world, okay, your resume does not matter, okay? That, that may sound really foreign, because you're like, oh my God, I gotta get my bullets, I gotta get my action verbs, like, I'm shipping it to Barb Hewitt for a review, you know, I'm knocking on her door begging for another one, you know, you know, maybe I'm calling Andrew and say, you know, can I get a look, you know, whatever. In the working world, your resume no longer matters. And the reason for that is in the working world, your resume is your portfolio of your work, okay? People in the working world do not judge you by where you went to school. They do not judge you by your SAT score. Nobody cares. They don't care what GPA you got. Nobody cares. And oh, by the way, the fact that you were, you know, whatever the laser pointer would point to, you know, that you took these classes, they really don't care, okay? What they do care is that you deliver like hell every time, every time. Anything that you produce, that you are the go-to person. And... The other challenge I would make to you is not simply that you deliver like hell every time, but that the work that you're doing has value and has meaning and has worth. So it's not just that you're doing a great job, but that the, the thing you're doing a great job on matters. It makes a difference. And it may not make a difference to you, but it makes a difference to somebody that you need to care about. So that's the first thing that you know I, I would kind of spin away from Management 101. We learned about like talent management systems. We learned about... Um, you know, we read a bunch of case studies, all management stuff, right? So, this next thing, okay, also for Management 101. Management 101, one of the things we cover are these HR systems sometimes, and, you know, the, the restructuring of those and the implications culturally and organizationally, whatever. I want you to think about when you're going to these networking events, when you're going to your companies, Let's say I'm Andrew Stern, okay, and I work at a, at a gas station, okay, let's envision this, right? I mean, I was a valet. I, I, have, I had three jobs the summer after uh, senior year of high school. That's how I bought my pen laptop. I was a pizza boy. I made pizzas and delivered them. Panera Bread was my biggest client. It's kind of ironic because they have sandwiches. Um, and then I used to uh, wait tables, and then I valeted cars at night at a really fancy restaurant. So, you know. I, you know, pump a tent could have been right there if I lived in New Jersey, but Michigan, we don't have that full service thing. So let's say I'm Andrew Stern at the pump a tent, okay? This is my business card. That's what I'm trying to emulate for you right now, okay? Who are you more interested in meeting? Andrew Stern, the pump attendant, or Andrew, you Stern, the petroleum executive? <laughs> Who are you interested in meeting, okay? I am the executive of that pump. I own your petroleum. You want it, you got to come talk to me, okay? <laughs> Who do you want to meet? Who do you want to meet? I mean, this guy, I'm like, on to the next one. Like, you want to meet the pump? No, I want to meet the petroleum executive, for crying out loud. Of course I want to meet the petroleum executive. He probably wears really nice suits. You know, don't wear jeans to come talk to Wharton. Whatever. The reason I bring this up, okay, is so as to say, I want you guys to say, I'm not, A, my resume, I'm my work, but in addition to not being my resume anymore, I have spin. Okay, I got a little something, okay? I said, you know, to Anish right before this talk, there's never been a 24 or 23 year old alumnus who gives these talks. There's a spin going on here. There's, there's something different. Andrew's wired a little funky, you know? 
That's what I'm trying to say. I want you to think about how can you repackage yourself? What's your brand? Okay. If I'm go, I go to all these Deloitte networking events with kids from NYU and Penn and you know other great universities, and you know I interact with great students. How are you going to be memorable? What am I going to remember about you? And it's not just the tie or the shoes or you know that your resume you know that you think I'm reading, that you think you know that it's printed out a really nice cardstock. That is part of it. Okay. But what else is it? Is it that instead of just coming to the info session, you came up to me and you said, Andrew, you know, I'm really interested in Deloitte. I'm so interested, in fact, that I want to plan an event for you guys. I want you to come back again, and I'm going to help organize that event for you on campus. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you, you're an applicant, and you want to plan an event? You want to help me do my job? You care about what I care about? You, you just changed the game a little bit. And oh, by the way... I am taking that resume now and folding over that top right corner, meaning I need to share your name with somebody because you are now memorable. Okay? You now made an impact on me. So think about how you can position yourself, how you can give yourself a little spin, how you can be different than the next person, both here and at your jobs. You are not your resume. You are your work. If the game is designed for you to lose, don't play that game. Play a different one. All right. We're making good progress. Um, so finance. <laughs> So I was so scared of finance uh, that I took it second semester senior year, which is probably a gamble for me because I knew that if I failed, you know, and given my track record with other quantitative courses, <laughs> the risk was high. You know, Andy Stefanovich would say, fail, you know, do it, you know, it's okay, you know, just fail. But then I wouldn't graduate and then I wouldn't be talking and, you know, I, my life would be very different. So who's this guy? Who? What'd you say? Sorry, I didn't hear. Jeremy Siegel. Ah, uh -uh. okay, good, good, good. I heard Steve Jobs, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, Steve up the the wardrobe. <laughs> so, Jeremy Siegel, I never had the pleasure of taking his course. Um, that would be at the honors level. I'm not at that level. It was, <laughs> I still am not. Um, but you know what? It, you know, in finance, you learned about like net present value, right? Think is that in finance? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> One of those classes. <laughs> Um, you learned about net present value. You learned about like pricing of bonds, right? Maybe or you know, like or stocks or stuff like that, right? How do you like the time value of money, all that kind of stuff. You know, and Jeremy teaches you know the advanced lecture. And the way I want to spin this content from finance is to say, in finance, you think about net present value, this idea that you have this bond or whatever security or item asset, and you want to maybe price it to now. What is it worth today? If I wanted to buy it today, if I wanted to sell it today, what is it worth now? I want you guys to think about what is the value of your time now at school? What can I be doing now to prepare myself for the career that I want? What is the career I want? And what, you know, what actions do I need to take now? I love this picture, not because it's a, a great watch manufacturer, you know, a, a boulevard or something, but because when you look at your watch, it's like, what, what time am I meeting that person? I'm meeting him now. What time am I going to that class? What time am I learning? What time am I you know, writing that paper? What time am I meeting my friends? It's all now. And you need to think about maximizing your time here and maximizing your time with your internships and the companies that you'll be a part of and approach your job. You know, think, of, think of your day every day. Okay? Think of it as a dream. Okay, you need to be living your dreams every day in some way. Okay, when you're you know staying up for 20 hours in an investment banking organization and you're hurting for you know you've done that for maybe four days in a row and it's really painful. What if in one of those 20 hours you helped link up your MD who has a child with a learning disability, like we're coming back to that same example, to somebody you knew? Okay. The power of now, the idea that you can do great things now, when you're at school, when you're in your job, it's now. And it's not, you know, don't, don't say, you know, I'm going to do X career for two years, and I'm gonna, then I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to have this, like, earth-shaking event. I'm going to do it for two years, and my life will be golden after those two years. I'm going to actually do what I want right then and there. No. Okay? Think about what you want. Okay? My roommate right now, terrific Wharton alumnus, Arun, Arun Das works at Goldman Sachs right now and thrilled okay to have had that experience at Goldman for two years okay and now you know he went into it saying you know what this is a step on my path okay my end game is not with Goldman Sachs they know that okay my end game is to be a doctor 
And why am I, why am I doing this stop at Goldman? It's to inform myself about the, the finance and the, the money dimension of hospitals that he one day wants to work in, that he is now going to med school for. Okay? So he has an idea of what now means to him. Now is, yeah, it was 20 hours. Yeah, I stayed up you know, that late. Yeah, I am you know, hurting today. But this is a part of my journey. This is educating me now. This will prepare me for then. It's not, you know, figure, you know, waste time, figure it out. You know, don't just say, you know what, I'm going to go to law school and you know, I'm going to figure it out when I'm in law school. And, you know, it'll just be, you know, I'll just, I'll reassess. No, no. Be true with yourself. Figure out what you want to do. I mean, no kid in Wharton my year solely concentrated in management and worked for a human capital consulting firm, Okay. No kid, okay? The students that I worked with from Penn, who moved with me to Deloitte, studied finance, marketing, you know, a bunch of concentrations. I said, you know what? The thing I'm really interested in is this people thing, the people dimension of businesses and how they operate and how we can make them more effective. That's my now. My now is to sacrifice going abroad so that I can TA for one of the greatest professors at the school. My now is to you know, sacrifice taking an upper level marketing course with Jonah Berger that I would love to take because I want to get one more management course in. My now is, you know what, I'm going to take a whole day of classes on Tuesday and then just sit in on the organizational dynamics master's degree class just because I want to learn what they're learning if they, if they won't give me credit. Okay? That's your now. So you got to say, what am I going to do to get to that level? What am I going to do to explore my passion in that way and add value every single day? Your day is your dream. Okay, the foremost challenge for leaders today is to maintain the clarity to stand confidently in the abundant universe of possibility. No matter how fierce the competition, how stark the necessity to go for the short-term goal, or how fearful people are, and no matter how urgently the wolf may appear at the door. Okay, so it's like, that's now. It's like, it's like you must be present. Okay, so I'm, we've done really good time. I'm thrilled with that. Uh, we've got five minutes left, and I'm happy to stay after if you guys want to talk more. Um, so final exam. So it's not like there's a quiz or anything. It's just a couple more slides. So this is you know just a collection, right? We started with Dr. G, right? Rock star. Okay. We went to Rebecca Stein. We talked about Chandra Hill. We looked at you know my friend Kabir who got me through statistics. Okay. You know we looked at all these people. We even looked at you know Andy Stefanovich, people who didn't teach at Wharton. Okay. My message here, and perhaps it would have been wiser if I excluded some of these teachers from the slide, is to communicate that every person you meet is a teacher, okay? Every single one of them, okay? And I literally carry a notepad, pull it out of my briefcase right now, of things I learn from other people at every moment, okay? Any hour of the day, okay? It's got random times, it's got random dates, it's not regular, it's not like I do it every day. Somebody's gonna teach me something at different points in my career, in my day, and I'm gonna capture it, and I'm gonna remember it, and I'm going to be a better person for it. So what you know, Jonah Berger teaches me, and what you know, I learned from Gavin Kasser, how Andy Stefanovich opens my eyes. Okay, every one of them is a teacher. Each of you are each other's teachers. Don't approach your Wharton, you know, experience saying, you know, looking over your shoulder, you know, I gotta beat this one. That's the wrong way to approach these classes. Okay, that's just not from a long-term perspective. That will not help you. Okay, what will help you is if you say, you know what? That's totally right. You just you you expanded my brain in a way that I, I didn't think about before. Or you know what? Let let's explore that further. Or let's get coffee to talk more about that. Every person will teach you something. So carry a notepad and be ready to take notes. All right. So this is the first quote: Energy. It's seventy-five percent of the job, and if you don't have it, be nice. <laughs> okay. Straight to the point. This guy's great, Paul Arden. He's got a great book. It's like one of those books you can probably flip through in twenty minutes, but got gems just like this. You should pick it up. So, energy, 75% of the job, okay? The idea is that I want you all to be so excited about what you're doing, whatever it is. If you're working for a nonprofit, if you're going to grad school, if you're going to work for a great consulting firm, if you're going to be at an investment banker, if you're going to go to law school, whatever your path is. You could be an entrepreneur, any of the paths, okay? Bring your A game every day, okay? I said deliver like hell and I meant it because... The way you will be remembered is through your work, okay? Always be thinking about how I can go above and beyond. Always be thinking about how I can help somebody else. Whether it's, I, you know, I, I just met with Stu Friedman, you know, the professor who I referenced ITA for, okay? 
And you know, I said to Stu, I was asking him point blank about his kids because he introduced me to his children. And I said, you know, what can I do? You know, does your son want to talk to somebody in film? He has an interest in film. I have a buddy who's in film. You want to talk to him? Awesome. Let's make it happen. Like, always be thinking about how you can help somebody else, and you will be a happier person and bring your evening. Okay, this one, you, you may be saying, oh, my God, like, I'm at the greatest undergraduate business school in America. Okay? I'm, you know, this is, this is the creme de la creme. This is the institution. And I want people to tell me that I'm doing a good job and that the work I deliver is top notch. I'm flipping it a little bit. Don't do that. Okay? People sometimes get fearful of simply delivering positive feed or simply uh, delivering negative feedback. Okay? They're, I want you to push people when they when you ask for feedback on a slide deck or a, a document that you write or an email. Always, how can it be better? Okay? Push them. Make them give you something to work from. Seek criticism, and you'll be better. The person who doesn't make mistakes is unlikely to make anything. Remember how we talked about that fall seven, get up eight? This is the idea, okay? You are going to make mistakes. I have made many mistakes, okay? I have made political, bureaucratic mistakes. I have made mistakes on deliverables that went in front of a client. I have, you know, had a, a poor internet connection while demoing our, our survey tool to a potential client. I've made boo-boos, okay? I've tripped up, okay? But from those mistakes, I've learned a lot. Okay, and every time it's happened, it's in the notebook. What could I do better? Jesus, I mean, why do you think I'm having this talk tape today? Think of yourself like an athlete, okay? If you ever played, a prof if you ever played at the professional level, and maybe you know, some of you will, I won't, but an athlete likely watches film, okay? They say, you know what? I played for four minutes in that game. You know, I may be on the bench, but I, I played for four minutes. I want to watch those four minutes. What did I do wrong? Was I, you know, boxing out in the wrong way, you know, or did I pass the puck and it was bouncing around? What did I do wrong? Okay? You made mistakes. You want to be introspective. How can I be better? All right, so remember the business card exercise? Right? Okay, like petroleum executive versus the pump operator? Get some spin. Okay? Get some spin. What is it? What is it? I mean, how are you going to make yourself memorable? Okay, so this is the, uh, the second to last slide. And this quote comes from uh, one of my great friends. Uh, not James, but he gave it to me. The master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence at whatever he does, leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. To him, he's always doing both. Okay? And I'm sorry that it's only he, because it should be he and she, or, you know, one, or whatever. Okay? The idea is simple. Okay? Today, there is no such thing as work-life balance. Okay? Throw the idea out the window. Okay? If there's anything, there's an idea of work-life integration. Okay? The idea that in your day, you're going to do things that you would characterize as work, and you would do things that you would characterize as life, okay? Building a slide deck, okay, may be considered work, okay? Maybe for life, it would be doing your laundry, for example, okay? But at the end of the day, all you really have is life. You have hours. That is your most valuable resource. And in those hours, you need to make the biggest, baddest, greatest contribution you can at whatever you do, okay? All you do is pursue excellence at whatever it is, and you know what? Let others decide. You want to work on your paper on a Friday night? Let them decide. You know what? You want to stay in and rock that paper out, and you want to get an award for it, and you want the professor to give you two rounds of feedback before you submit it? Be that person, okay? Because that's you, okay? And let someone else judge you. You can leave them in the dust, okay? They're not the people that you need to be surrounding yourself with. You need to be surrounded by people that want you to do everything you feel you need to do to achieve your full potential, okay? So that's our, our thesis for the day. How good do you want to be, okay? And that, that's the talk. Um, I, I just leave you with that thought. So to say, how good do you want to be? You are at the premier undergraduate business program. You are surrounded by brilliant minds. You are taught by even more phenomenal minds. You have access to a robust alumni network. You have the greatest companies in the world at your fingertips through PenLink, okay? It's yours for the taking. It's, it's that simple, okay? I always say, you know, to my sister, um, who's at Michigan, um, you know, when she's going into interviews, I say, now you walk into it, and you think 
Like, you are going to win this. This is yours for the taking. Nobody can stop you. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can compete with you. And with that mindset, you ask yourself, that's, that's how good I'm going to be. That, uh, that's me. This job is me. This interview is mine. This job is mine. And if you approach life in that way, yeah. you're going to go far. So here's my, uh, my contact info if you guys want that. Um, but you know, I'm really grateful to be here and you know, we can show up a video. Um, happy to field any questions you guys got.